John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Over, Jackson, Johnny. Oh, hello, Mr. Jackson. How are you? No, not too good, Johnny. That is, our company isn't. If you're not on a case, I'd like you to conduct an investigation for us. I'm at your service. Good. Our company writes a group health and hospitalization policy at the Rick's Bearing Company. Where is that? In Rick City, Florida. Employees 3,000. We cover the employees and their families. And? We've just received a claim on behalf of a Bobby Foster, the child of a machinist of Rick's. For what? An operation involving a team of neurosurgeons and technicians that had to be flown to Rake City by chartered plane from Boston. Now, what do you want me to do? Uh, Dr. Grant Howell, director of the Rake City Hospital, has passed a report to the claim. A report which we think bears investigation. Okay, I'll get right on it. Fine, Johnny. And don't spare any expense. If Dr. Howell's report bears out, there's a vicious racket spreading. A racket which victimizes children. <laughs> At this point in our program, I'd like to give you something to think about. Probably one of the most quoted Americans in our nation's history is Benjamin Franklin. It was Franklin who said, Early to bed, early to rise, makes a man healthy, wealthy, and wise. And never leave that till tomorrow, which you can do today. And, of course, the Lord helps them that help themselves. But probably one of his most familiar quotations is, there are only two things in life of which we may be certain, death and taxes. Of course, what bothers most of our taxpayers is that death and taxes don't come in that order. But seriously, one of the biggest jobs handled by the Secretary of the Treasury is the collection of taxes, our government's main source of income. The government raises money through the Bureau of Internal Revenue, which collects income taxes, excise taxes, amusement taxes, and other federal taxes. The Bureau also checks to see that you haven't paid too little and, believe it or not, that you haven't paid too much. Another way the government raises money is through the Bureau of Customs, which levies taxes on imports which are sent here from foreign countries. But although the Treasury Department collects the money, it is Congress, the men we send to Washington, who actually says who will pay taxes and how much. And that's one thing from which none of us can escape. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office National Medical and Hospitalization Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bobby Foster matter. Expense account item one, $85.56. Plane fare and incidentals between Hartford and Miami, Florida. Item two, $2.60. Bus fare between Miami and Rig City. A spick and span little town with coral white streets shaded by tropical trees. I registered at the Kachubi Hotel, then went directly to Dr. Howell's office in the modern air conditioned hospital. Good afternoon. Hello. May I help you? I'd like to see Dr. Howell, please. Well, the doctor doesn't see patients after five. I'm afraid you'll have to return tomorrow. Unless it's an emergency. Well, I understand it is. My name is Johnny Dollar. I'm representing National Medical. Oh, gee. I'm sorry. That's all right. Is the doctor in? Well, he's looking in on a patient, Mr. Dollar, but he expects you. Oh? The insurance company phoned you were coming. I see. It's pretty awful what happened to little Bobby Foster. I've never seen Dr. Howell so upset. Just exactly what did happen. You don't know? Not the details, no. Well, if Dr. Howell is right, it, it, it's It's terrible. But he'd better tell you. Well, won't you sit down, Mr. Dollar? Oh, thanks. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. You see, I, I heard some matches. Oh, here you are. <laughs> it worked. Hang out the flag. Well, how do you like Rig City, Mr. Dollar? Well, I haven't been here long enough to know. How do you like it, Miss... Uh... Uh, Rogers. Flo Rogers. I haven't been here very long myself, just a little over two months. Oh? Oh, I like the sunshine, the clean street. But what? It's just a little dull. Well, is that so? Well, maybe something can be done about that, Miss Rogers. 
It uh, is Miss, isn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. Sure is. I'm glad you approve. I not only approve, I applaud. Oh, on behalf of the Sphinxes of America, I thank you. <laughs> oh, that must be Dr. Hall. Excuse me? Reluctantly. <laughs> Doctor, we'll see you, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Oh, come in. Come in. Have a seat. Thanks, Dr. Howell. Well, your company acts fast. Only mailed that claim day before yesterday. National Medical feels it's an unusually high claim, You're Doctor. You're suggesting I padded it? Oh, certainly not. But a team of neurosurgeons flown down from it Boston... It's necessary to save the boy's life, I assure you. Well, don't misunderstand, Doctor. National Medical isn't challenging your professional opinion. I should hope not. The report you attached is what interested my company. It should. It should interest the whole country. I didn't have the opportunity to read it, Doctor. Perhaps it's you a just... potential child killer, Mr. Dollar. A vicious, unscrupulous racket, capitalizing on panic, fear. Well, come with me. I want you to see what they've done to an innocent child. Bobby Foster? Yes. No, Doctor. Well, there he is, Mr. Dollar. A five-year-old boy. Victim of a panic-stricken parent and a criminal operator. What are his chances? We won't know until he comes out of coma. If he does. And then? For complete recovery, no chance. For partial recovery, a fair chance. Bobby Foster will be paralyzed. You said a criminal operator. Who? If I knew, Mr. Dollar, I wouldn't bother with reports to insurance companies. I've been a doctor 40 years now. Seen a lot of pain and tragedy. But this... This... Let's go back to your office, Doctor. Uh, sorry, Mr. Dollar. I must be overtired. Shouldn't let these things get to me. Well, after seeing that boy, I can't blame you. Cigarette? Yes, thank you. Now, let's have the story from the beginning. Huh? Well, <clears throat> we, we had a polio scare here recently. Some of our children came down with fever, headache, sore throat, symptoms resembling polio. Was it polio? No. But to confirm my diagnosis, I called in a polio specialist from Miami. Meanwhile, epidemic rumors spread through the town. Parents got panicked. They held a mass meeting. For what purpose? Uh, they demanded I inject every child in town with gamma globulin. That's the polio preventive? Yes. And did you? Certainly not. Gamma globulin is impossible to get unless a genuine polio epidemic is threatening. The government has to ration it carefully because one whole blood donation is required to manufacture a single injection. You know how many demands there are on the whole blood supply these days. Of course. Well, to get to Bobby Foster's case, I was called to the Foster home last week. Found the boy in a coma. He had all the symptoms of embolism. Of what? Cerebral embolism, caused in this case by an air bubble entering a blood vessel and being carried to the brain. Well, that would cause paralysis, wouldn't it? Yes, and possible death. And so you called in the neurosurgeon? I didn't feel qualified to undertake such a specialized operation. Well, just how did the air bubble enter the boy's bloodstream? Through criminal carelessness, by way of a hypodermic injection. Any proof? Well, the needle mark's still on the boy's arm. And you have no idea who injected Bobby? None. But I know this. Other children in this town have been injected, too. Oh? In their cases, fortunately, no harm was done. Well, surely Bobby's parents know who injected him. Yeah. That's the wicked stupidity of it, Mr. Dollar. They deny the boy was given any kind of an injection. But you think they're lying? Of course they're lying. The boy was running a fever. The parents thought it was polio. They panicked, took him to some quack for an injection of what they were told was gamma globulin. At a black market price, no doubt. To a frightened parent, price would be no object, Mr. Dollar. Well, I'll see the boy's parents. They can be persuaded to tell who's behind this racket. You're wasting your time, Mr. Dollar. I've tried repeatedly. They refuse to admit their responsibility. Afraid criminal charges will be brought against them? Perhaps. But they have another child. A girl. Seven. You're thinking the girl has been threatened if the parents talk? 
I wouldn't put anything past the ghouls who operate this racket, Mr. Dollar. Yes, yes, I would figure, Doctor. Well, thanks. I'll check with you if I turn up anything. Just do that, Mr. Dollar. And be careful. I always am. And you ease up, huh? He's very perturbed, isn't he? Well, he has a right to be, Miss Rogers. Uh, do you have the Foster's address? Oh, yes. I, I prepared this for you. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Well, I'll take a run over there now. I wish see. I could help you. You've been very helpful already. No, I, I mean really help. If there's anything I can do, a- anything you need or need to know. Well, I could use a little background information you know, about the town and the people. I tell you what, why don't we have dinner tonight? Then I can get the rundown on Rig City and a little nourishment at the same time. Well. You have another engagement? Uh, no, no, I haven't. It's just that, well, I didn't want you to think I was angling for a date. Oh, now, look, I have a pretty good memory, and I distinctly remember that I asked you to dinner. I, I know, but. I think it's your civic duty to dine with me. <laughs> well, if you put it that way, as a good citizen, how can I with you? That's the spirit. You name the place. Well, there's a, a restaurant called The Tropics, a bar and grill sort of place. It isn't 21, but it isn't bad either. I'm with you. What time shall we meet? Around 6. I'll be there if I have to crawl. <laughs> All right, but wouldn't a taxi cab be more practical? <laughs> See you at 6. the hospital with the sound of Flo Rogers' laugh still rustling in my ears. It occurred to me that Rig City might be a very pleasant place under different circumstances. I hailed a cab and ran up expense account item three, 75 cents, fare and tip to the Foster's bright little cottage, a stone's throw from the beach. Yes. Mrs. Foster? Yes. I represent the National Medical Insurance Company. We have insurance where my husband works. Uh, just a minute, Mrs. Foster. Please. I said we already have medical insurance. Yes, with my company. Oh. I'd like to talk to you. May I come in? No. That is, my husband It'll is It'll only home. take a minute, Mrs. Foster. If it's about the premiums, I can't help you. They're supposed to be deducted from my husband's face. It's about Bobby. I can't answer any questions. You have to see my husband. I think you have the information I need. What information? About the injection Bobby had. <laughs> the one he that didn't. nearly caused his death. No. You're wrong. Bobby didn't have an injection. Dr. Howell says the needle mark is still on the boy's arm. No. Is someone threatening to harm your other child if you talk? Please, go away. Please. You have a moral obligation, Mrs. Foster. I can't answer any questions. Other children are being victimized, too. Could end up in the hospital like your son. <laughs> Only half alive because their parents were panicked into buying phony drugs from the black market. We were, we were so worried that Bobby had polio. So worried. Who gave Bobby the injection? I, I can't tell. I can't. You've got to tell. But I know, girl. Margaret. They said Harris. they... That's enough. I, I didn't tell him anything, Edward. Get inside. Where's Margaret? Inside, I said. Oh. So you're Bobby's father. That's right, mister. I'm Johnny I Dollar. know who you are, insurance company detective. Investigate. Have it your way, but get off my property. Did they threaten your little girl if you talk? I'm to warning you. You can get police protection, Foster. Just name the man who gave Bobby that shot. I don't know what you're talking about. I... Now, you... you get off my place. Use your head, Foster. You're covering up for the worst kind of scum. Talk. You owe it to your son, to the other kids that are being victimized. All right, Dollar. I warned you to get out. Now, don't now. be a fool, Foster. I will oh. Get up. I didn't come here to brawl with you, Foster. I'm investigating... I said get up. Get on your feet and clear out of here. Since you asked me so nicely, sure. So many great men have attained the highest office in our land, the presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? He was our second oldest president, being elected for that office when he was 66 years old, 
and our only bachelor president. In 1828, he was appointed minister to Russia by President Jackson. In 1856, when he became president, differences between the North and South caused much unrest in his cabinet and in the various departments of the government. While he was president, the Confederate states were formed and the Civil War began. If you don't have his name by now, here are two more important clues. During his administration, the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates were held and the first Atlantic cable was laid. Who was he? James Buchanan, 15th President of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. My face and my clothes were pretty much the worst for wear. I went back to the Kachubi Hotel for a shower and a change and a little elementary first aid. It helped, but not much. What with one thing and another, it was nearly 7 o'clock by the time I got a cab and ran up expense account item 4, 85 cents to the Tropics Cafe. I spotted Flo Rogers in a corner booth. Well, hearty greetings and humble apologies. Good evening, don't apologize. After all, you're only an hour late. I'm sorry. I had a little repair work to do. Repair work? Johnny, what happened to your face? I was overmatched. I lost the decision, and it wasn't close. Someone beat you up? Well, that's one way of putting it. Mr. Foster did the honors. But why? He thought I was a little too inquisitive. Oh, Johnny. He must be an awful man. No, he's a frightened man. Frightened out of his wits. His little girl's life has been threatened. What? How do you know? Mrs. Foster was on the verge of admitting it when her husband barged in. Oh. oh. Well, what are you going to do now? Starting tomorrow, I'm going to question every parent in town. Do these other children have been infected? Well, Dr. Howell thinks so, and his figures. A group of grifters move into a family town, spread polio rumors around, then make a killing selling phony gamma globulin shots to parents who are scared silly for their children's health. Johnny. Yeah? You're going on with this investigation? I certainly in spite of what's happened to you already, you're determined to go on? Why, sure I am. What are you driving at, Flo? I guess I'd better tell you then. Tell me what? Well, tonight when I first came in, I sat at one of those little tables near the bar. See, that, that one over there, behind the jukebox. Yeah, so? I heard the bartender whispering to a man. Well, what did he say to him? He was telling him where to take his child for an injection. An injection? Of gamma globulin? I think so. I couldn't be sure. I couldn't hear everything he said. Where did he tell the man to take his child? Did you hear that? No, I told you. He was whispering. The man he was talking to, is he still around? No, I, I don't see him. Did you know him? No, it's just one of the customers. Okay. Thanks. Where are you going? To dig my elbows in that bar. You run along home. We'll have that dinner some other time. Promise you'll be careful. On my honor. I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. That makes two of us. I settled on a stool at the bar and ran up expense account item five. Ten dollars and seventy cents. For more than a few double bourbons with which I slowly drank myself into a mood so dark that my neighbors moved to the other end of the bar. Hey. Hey, Skinny. Come here. Name's Mickey, sir. I told you before. Well, I'll show you this. So what? Well, don't just stand there, Skinny. Fill me up. I think you've had enough, sir. You need a cup of coffee. Black. What I need, you can't get for me, pal. Nobody can. You sound like a man that's got woman trouble. What do you mean, woman trouble? Well, my little wife is the finest, sweetest... Yeah, sure, sure. You're crazy about her and the kids, too. How do you know I got kids? Well, you're the type. Family man. No kids. No kids. Now, look, I'll get you that coffee and then a cab to take you home to the kids. Okay? Okay. Hey. Hey, wait a minute. Come here. Yeah? 
You're a swell guy, Skinny. You understand when a man's got trouble. Yeah, sure. Forget it. Just that my kids are sick. My wife is worried half out of her mind. I had to get out of the house. I had to get away for an hour. You say your kids are sick? Yeah. Wife's scared of polio. What does the doctor say? Oh, a lot of mumble jumbo. Everybody knows there's a polio epidemic in this town. The doctors are afraid to admit it. Because they can't get the stuff to stop it. Gamma globulin? That's the only thing that'll save my kids. The only thing. Uh, listen, mister. Maybe I can help you. Huh? Get you some gamma globulin. Where? Where, Skinny? I'll say anything. Anything. Here. Go to this address. The party there will tell you where to take your kids for the shot. bar and piled into a cab. On the way to the address Mickey had given me, I stopped at a highway diner and ran up expense account item six. Thirty cents for a carton of steaming black coffee. Not that I was in need of sobering so much. I just wanted something to take the sudden chill off my spine. If you've ever had a date with a grave robber, you know what I mean. It was 2 a.m. when the cabbie dropped me at the driveway of what looked to be a deserted beach house. I paid him off. Expense account item seven. Dollar and twenty cents tip and fare. And started up the drive toward the vine covered gate. That's far enough, Dollar. Who's there? Oh. Just shut up or I'll snap your neck, Dollar. What? That's right. Don't give me any trouble. Okay, okay. Ease up. Whatever you come along easy and no funny business. Yeah, yeah. All right. Put your hands behind your head. Clasp them. Don't turn around. Okay. Where's your gun? I didn't bring one. You got less tense than I thought, Dollar. I had my reason. Let's go out the gate. My car's down the road. Foster drove away from town, using the back road. A tire iron clutched in one huge hand in case I got ideas. Once, out of the corner of my eye... I thought I saw the big guy's lip tremble, like a scared kid. He finally pulled up beside a long, sleek auto trailer, parked in a lonely beach cove. He motioned me out and followed me to the door. Hello, Donny. Well, Flo. Surprise. No. You're working with a bartender, aren't you, Flo? <laughs> of course. He's my husband. Oh, it's figures. Oh. Come in and tell me, Donnie. And please be good. Just as long as you have that gun pointed at me. I hate to. But I'd never think. That figures, too, Flo. Foster, yeah. wait in your car. Oh. Cozy, these trailers. You make you an eye like this, huh? Come on, Johnny. I'll get your drink while you wait for it. No, thanks. Oh, you're pouting. You're disappointed in me. Not very. Tell me, why weren't you surprised to find me here? On the way over here, I got to thinking. This afternoon, when I met Foster, he already knew my name. I hadn't given it to anyone but the doctor and you. <laughs> Careless of me to have mentioned your name when I warned Foster you were coming. Just what kind of a hold have you got on him? His little girl. You kidnapped her. Oh, no, Johnny. We're just keeping Margaret for a little while. You see, the Fosters had been very responsive to Mickey's warning. But then you came into town. And drastic measures were in order. We haven't harmed Margaret. How did you get her? Foster came by the hospital after you left. See his son. He left Margaret in a waiting room. And you phoned your husband. Mickey's wonderful with children. She was tickled pink to go for a soda with him. Real sweet people, you and Mickey. We really hate this, Johnny. Believe me. Yeah, sure. What happened to Bobby Foster was an unfortunate accident. Who gave Bobby the injection? Mickey. I can't stand the sight of a needle. Some sweet rest. Oh, they do very well. Traveling from place to place. 
They didn't drop. Following the epidemic like a pair of buzzards sailing astray. Self-righteousness doesn't become you, Johnny. What do you charge for a shot? Fifty dollars. What's in them? Nothing harmful. Just colored water. And once in a while, an air bubble. That was an accident. I'll take the gun slow. Oh, Mickey, I didn't hear you drive up. Everything all right? Foster did exactly as he was told. Good. Hmm. Low dollar. You play a lousy drunken father. I'm usually better. But tonight, I didn't extend myself. Huh? I had a hunch you'd want this meeting to take place before I started questioning the other parents in town. Because you knew I was bound to find a mother or father who'd identify you two. Oh. Then you've been willing to make a deal all along, huh, Donna? Well, let's say I hated to spoil your fun. Especially clothes. What's that correct me? Ask your lonesome wife. Don't listen to her, Mickey. She plays a very convincing bachelor girl. She's trying to make trouble. A little too convincing. Shut up, Donna. And she talks a lot. Talk? She told me everything just now. Even that you've done away with Foster's little girl. What? I didn't. I said... Mickey, behind you! Come on! A gun! Shoot, Mickey! Shoot! I'll take the gun, Flo. Let me go. Now sit down and behave. You you hurt me, Johnny. Give it to me, Dolly. The gun. I'm going to kill him. No, Foster. Give me the gun, Dolly. It's all right. I said this. You understand me? She's all right. You said he killed her. Well, I had to. It was the only way I could uh, shock you into making a move. You're not just saying it, Dollar. Margaret's really safe. Tell him, Flo. Yes. She's all right. This case deserves publicity, Mr. Jackson. Lots of it. Scared parents make easy dupes for operators like Flo Rogers and Mickey. And when innocent kids end up the victims, it's intolerable. Dr. Howell tells me that all the gamma globulin manufactured goes to the Office of Defense Mobilization, where it's distributed to local health departments, who in turn pass it on to MDs only. Expense account item eight, $94. Bus, plane fare, and incidentals between Rig City and Hartford. Expense account total, $196.96. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar.